trace and revoke with optimal parameters from polynomial hardness. This is work by Shweta Agrawal, Simran Kumari, Anshu Yadav, and Shota Yamada, and Simran will be giving a talk. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking about broadcast trace and revoke with optimal parameters from polynomial hardness. This is a joint work with Shweta Agrawal, Anshu Yadav, and Shota Yamada. Uh, let us begin with the motivation for our problem. Uh, let us consider a content distributor, say Netflix, that wants to share some movie uh, with its users. The guarantee that it would like to have is that uh, only the subscribed user should be able to get access to this movie. Um, one trivial approach to do this would be uh, using a public key encryption scheme, uh, where it can use the public key of the subscribed users to encode this movie and share it with them. But uh, our trivial uh, problem with this approach is that uh, the size of the ciphertext uh, will grow linearly with the number of subscribed users or number of the users involved in the system. And uh, in general, there could be millions of users subscribed to the Netflix, and computing millions of ciphertext is obviously a problem. So a question that we can ask here is, uh, can we have a better approach? Uh, can we have a short common ciphertext uh, that we can use to uh, broadcast this data? And by short, I mean uh, uh, the size of the ciphertext could be sublinear in the number of uh, users, or even better, logarithmic in the number of users. Along, if, along with this, uh, it could so happen that uh, some of the users in the system could turn out to be malicious. So uh, these users can come together and uh, design a decoder box that decodes messages uh, that were just meant to be uh, learned by the valid users. So here, these users can cleverly uh, pool their access key and uh, design this decoder box in such a way that uh, you could just learn, uh, what you could learn from this decoder box is just the input-output behavior. So uh, another question that one could ask here is, uh, can we catch a valid malicious user here? So uh, by valid, I mean a user with a, a valid uh, access key who participated in designing this decoder. So uh, all these questions are answered affirmatively by the notion of broadcast trace and revoke, uh, where uh, there are multiple users in the system, and each user has a user-specific secret key. And this uh, authority can uh, broadcast a data by encrypting it uh, with some common master public key. Uh, this notion has been studied under different names in the literature. So if the encoding of data happens with respect to the set of authorized users, we call it broadcast and trace. And the guarantee here is that any user in this valid set should be able to use their key and uh, uh, recover the message from this encoded uh, data. If the encoding happens with respect to the set of uh, non-validated user or uh, revoked user, we call it trace and revoke. And the guarantee here is similar, but stated differently, that any user outside this list L should be able to use their key to uh, recover this data M from the ciphertext. Uh, in our work, um, we call if we achieve uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, so if this encoding happens with respect to the revoke list L and uh, the ciphertext that we achieve is independent of the size of uh, encoded list, we prefer calling it broadcast trace and revoke. Uh, in this notion, if some of the users turn out to be malicious and uh, design a decoder, uh, then uh, the guarantee we have here is that there exists a tracing algorithm which can help us trace back to a valid malicious user. So in this toy example, here, uh, user three has a valid key, and uh, he or she participated in designing this decoder. So this tracing algorithm will output that user three is the traitor. Uh, this notion provides us uh, multiple guarantees. The first one is of message hiding, which says that no matter how many users in L come together and pool their keys, they will not be able to learn uh, the data from this uh, ciphertext. Uh, the second guarantee is of secure tracing, which says that uh, this tracing algorithm will output at least one valid malicious user. That is, it will output one malicious user outside L. Another guarantee we have is that uh, no honest user will be falsely accused. So uh, we study this primitive of broadcast trace and revoke uh, in two notions. The first notion, uh, two notion of traceability. The first notion is public traceability, uh, which says that uh, the tracing algorithm uses the master public key to run. Uh, so anyone in the system can use the master public key and run the tracing algorithm. 
The other notion uh, is of private traceability, uh, in which the tracing algorithm runs using the master secret key. So, okay, now um, once, um, let us say we have this tracing algorithm, uh, which is given this access to the decoder and it outputs a valid traitor. Now, as you can see, uh, this key is associated with an index, and uh, once this tracing algorithm outputs the index of the traitor, the authority would like to hold that user accountable and take some action against it. So uh, it needs to get back to this uh, user index user identity mapping. So it will store a table that uh, says which uh, user identity was mapped to that index. And uh, using this table, it can uh, get back to the identity of the traitor and uh, you know maybe revoke its access key. So uh, Nishimaki, Wix, and Zandri in their work pointed out that this approach of uh, going via mapping this identity to index and then uh, using it to generate secret keys has certain limitations. Uh, the first one is obvious of maintaining this uh, user index, user identity table. Uh, the second is that in the case of public traceability where um, anyone should be able to run the tracing algorithm, this table needs to be made public and uh, then it would compromise the identity of even the honest users. So uh, this method uh, is certainly problematic. And uh, Nishimaki, Wix, and Zantri in their work proposed a solution of embedding identities, and they said, we would rather want to embed the identity of the user directly in the secret key rather than going via the index path. Uh, but achieving this notion of embedded identities was particularly challenging. Um, in the traditional tracing method that existed, uh, we use a linear search method on the user space to get uh, to the traitors. Now, uh, we note that even for polynomial number of users, the identity space could be exponential, and using this linear search method would lead us exponential time uh, in getting to the traitors, which is not desirable. There were multiple solutions proposed uh, to this. Uh, one of them is by Nishimaki et al. in the same work, where uh, they propose new techniques to do this tracing and uh, also give constructions of traitor tracing and trace and revoke schemes with embedded identities. Another solution was proposed by Goyle, Coppola, and Waters, where they come up with a different uh, technique to um, do the tracing and uh, also show a traitor tracing scheme with embedded identities. Um, now we look at uh, the goals, the properties that we would want for our broadcast trace and revoke scheme. So the first goal uh, property that we would want is of optimal parameters where uh, I would want that, we would want that the size of ciphertext, uh, the public key and the secret key is independent of the number of users or more specifically uh, the set of targeted users. Uh, another guarantee uh, that we want here is of adaptive security uh, with respect to revocation lists. So in our notion, um, we see that the encryption happens with respect to a revoke list L. And uh, in the adaptive version of the security that we define, uh, we give the flexibility to the adversary to output this list after he or she gets to see the public parameters and user secret keys. And uh, another property that we would like to achieve is of embedded identities. And uh, we would like to achieve all these three properties in both the public and secret trace setting. So now let us move uh, on to the prior work in the public trace setting. So the work by Nishimaki et al. achieves optimal parameters uh, along with embedded identities by relying on I.O. Uh, but they only manage to achieve selective security. The work by Goyle et al. achieves optimal parameters uh, along with adaptive security by relying on sub-exponential positional witness encryption uh, and uh, they do not manage to achieve embedded identities in their work. In our work, we achieve optimal parameters uh, along with adaptive security and embedded identities by relying just on polynomially hard assumptions. So looking at these assumptions more closely in the public trace setting, the work by Nishimaki et al. uses identity, uh, indistinguishability obfuscation, which is inherently a sub-exponential assumption. The work by Goyle et al. Uh, uh, uses uh, positional witness encryption and their security proof incurs an exponential loss, uh, which is why they need to rely on sub-exponential security of PWE. And moreover, we do not know of um, any construction of PWE from uh, polynomially hard assumptions. Uh, in our work, uh, we, uh, we rely on uh, polynomially hard assumptions of uh, functional encryption and uh, attribute-based encryption. So I'll briefly uh, tell you what these uh, primitives are. We already saw this in previous session. 
So in a functional encryption scheme, the secret key is, is associated with the circuit, and when you decrypt an encoded data, uh, all you learn is the circuit va value on the data and nothing else. Uh, in an attribute-based encryption scheme, uh, the input that is encoded has uh, two parts. One is public and one is private. And uh, when we decrypt it using a secret key associated with a circuit C, uh, we learn the private part if and only if C of X is 1. So this variation where the secret key is associated with the uh, policy, uh, we call it key policy attribute-based encryption scheme. Uh, there is another variation of it where Sorry, where uh, the ciphertext is associated with the policy, and we call it uh, ciphertext policy uh, ABE scheme. So uh, coming back to the assumptions of our public trace setting, uh, we get our construction uh, relying on special FE and special KP AB. So by special, I mean we use uh, these uh, primitives with uh, certain efficiency properties, and both of which are known from polynomially hard assumptions. So we achieve all the goals by relying on just polynomially hard assumptions. Coming to secret traceability, uh, the work by Goyle et al. Uh, uses standard assumptions, uh, but it uh, fails to achieve optimal parameters or embedded identities. Uh, the work by Zandri improves over the work of Goyle et al., and he shows a trade-off between the size of ciphertext public key and a secret key, uh, but by relying on a non-standard uh, security model of a generic group uh, model. Um, the work by Zandri also does not achieve embedded identities. Uh, in our work, we show that by tweaking the construction of Goyle et al., we can actually uh, uh, modify, uh, we can actually achieve a construction uh, with uh, optimal ciphertext. The work by Kim and Wu, um, they achieve uh, optimal size secret key and optimal size public key. They do achieve embedded identities uh, by relying on the hardness of learning with errors. Uh, but uh, their ciphertext scales linearly in the size of the revocation list that they support. Uh, in our work, we achieve optimal parameters uh, for uh, the uh, si optimal size for all the parameters, uh, and we do achieve embedded identities by relying on polynomially hard assumptions. So, uh, looking at the assumptions more closely in the secret trace setting, uh, the work by Goyle et al. and Zandri both uses pairings, uh, which is insecure in the post quantum regime. Uh, the work by Kim and Wu does use a post-quantum secure assumption of lattices, uh, but the security proof incurs an exponential loss, which is why they need to rely on sub-exponentially secure LWE. And moreover, their ciphertext is not optimal. In our work, we rely on special ABEs, uh, both of which are known from polynomially hard assumptions uh, based on lattices, uh, which is constructed to be uh, post-quantum safe. Uh, I would also like to uh, take a minute to compare the techniques of our public trace and secret trace setting. So uh, to achieve the stronger notion of public traceability, we rely on a primitive in Ophistopia, which is uh, compact functional encryption. Uh, to achieve the weaker notion, we just do it with uh, special ABEs. And uh, I would like to mention that uh, attribute-based encryption is much weaker than functional encryption, since ABE is an all-or-nothing primitive, as in contrast to FE. So we achieve our weaker notion by relying on weaker primitives. So uh, now I give an outline of our, work, uh, of our construction. So we reach uh, embedded identity broadcast trace and uh, revoke uh, from an intermediate notion of revocable predicate encryption. So uh, this revocable predicate encryption was introduced by Kim and Wu in their work in the secret trace setting, but we generalize it to uh, the public uh, in the secret key setting, but we generalize it to the public key setting in our work. So here I present the definition for the public key setting. So in a revocable predicate encryption, each secret key is associated with a label and an attribute, and uh, the authority maintains a list of uh, labels. To encode a data, uh, it is encoded with respect to a predicate F and uh, a revoke list L. And uh, the guarantee here is that um, you can learn this M from the ciphertext uh, using a secret key if uh, the function associated with the ciphertext satisfies the attribute associated with your key and you are a non-revoked user. That is, the label should not be in the list L. It also satisfies few security properties. Uh, the first one is of uh, message hiding security, which says that the encryption of two different messages with respect to same function and uh, the revoke list should be indistinguishable if you do not have a decrypting que uh, key query. Uh, decrypting keys, uh, which means that for all key queries, uh, f of x should be zero or the label should be revoked. 
Another security guarantee that it satisfies is of function hiding security, which says that encryption of two different functions uh, with respect to the same message and the revoke list L should be indistinguishable if for all key queries, uh, the function value both F0 of X is equals to F1 of X or uh, the label is in L. So um, at a very high level, since I'm not going to go into the construction, I would like to point out that this label uh, check, uh, the membership check, this uh, helps us do the membership, membership check in our broadcast trace and revoke scheme. And this uh, function evaluation on this uh, attribute uh, helps us with the tracing in our broadcast trace and revoke scheme. So moving on, um, I would like to point out that to get to um, embedded identity broadcast trace and revoke from RPE, we use uh, techniques, we adapt the techniques of Goyle et al. that they introduced in context of uh, data tracing. Uh, we adapt it to include uh, the revocation list in our setting. So um, I'd be giving a very brief outline uh, of our public key revocable predicate encryption scheme. Uh, we get it using compact functional encryption scheme and uh, key policy AB with succinct keys. So by compact FE, I mean that the size of FE ciphertext is independent of the size of function that this FE scheme supports. Um, and uh, in a key policy AB with succinct keys, uh, by succinct keys, I mean the size of the secret key is independent of the size of function and the attribute length supported by this ABE scheme. So these properties let us achieve optimality in our uh, public key RP scheme. Uh, for the secret key RP scheme, uh, we introduce uh, and construct the primitive of revocable mixed FE, which I would not have the time to introduce right now. So uh, we construct this revocable mixed FE and uh, compile it with a CPAB scheme to achieve our secret key uh, revocable predicate encryption scheme. Uh, this revocable MFE in turn is achieved from uh, multiple other primitives. Uh, what I would like to mention here is uh, how we get optimal parameter of our uh, secret key RP. So here again, um, key policy AB with succinct keys and ciphertext uh, policy AB with compact ciphertext help us in achieving optimal parameters. Uh, I would like to summarize uh, our work uh, now. Um, we introduce a unified framework for uh, achieving uh, secret key and public uh, key embedded identity broadcast trace and revoke via the notion of revocable predicate encryption scheme. In the public traceability, uh, we achieve optimal parameters. Uh, we achieve embedded identities and adaptive security by relying on polynomially hard assumptions. Uh, one open question that we would like to pose here is if we can come up with a construction that is secure in post-quantum regime using weaker version of functional encryption. In the secret traceability, we achieve optimal parameters and embedded identities relying just on polynomially hard assumptions. Um, we do not achieve adaptive security in the secret traceability setting and leave it as an open question. Um, Another question could be if we, uh, we rely on evasive and tensor LWE, which is used to construct uh, CPAB. Uh, this was recently constructed by V and Sabri in their independent works. So uh, this primitive, sorry, uh, it was a misinformation. So this primitive of evasive and tensor LWE was introduced by V and Sabri in their independent works. So another open question could be if we could rely on more standard lattices assumptions uh, to get um, a construction in secret trace setting. Um, I would also like to point out that ours is the first work to support super polynomial uh, size revocation list. So as long as we can uh, do this membership testing efficiently and represent this uh, super poly revoke list efficiently, uh, we can support it in our construction. Thank you. Great, so we have time for maybe one question. So if you have a question, please come up to the microphones. So I guess maybe I will start. Could you comment on a little bit on where exactly you need the evasive slash tensor LWE? So what is the exact succinctness property you need on the underlying ABE schemes? So uh, we use the ciphertext policy uh, CPAB to get independence of the revocation list L that we support in our scheme. So this is why we rely on CPAB from the work of V. Mm -hmm. uh, which has this property, which has this compact ciphertext. Mm -hmm. So this is how the, and uh, V uses evasive and tensor LWE to get CPAB, which is how this evasive and tensor LWE comes in picture. I see, great. Are there any other questions? If not, let's thank Ming Ramana again.
All right, so our next talk will be on trader tracing with n to the one-third size ciphertext and uh, order one size keys from Kaylin. Uh, this is work by Junqing Gong, Ji Luo, and Ho Tak Wee, and Ji will be giving the talk. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so let's ju jump right into the definitions. Uh, in trader tracing, um, there's a... Um, uh, there's a broadcast uh, provider who wants to provide encrypted, encrypted broadcast to multiple subscribers. And the worry is that one of the subscribers might provide their key or provide their key in, um, in a black box to the, um, to the outsiders. And um, then the, the mitigation from the broadcaster is to be able to trace um, the key that was used in creating this pirate decoder. And uh, the basic requirement is that uh, you can find at least one trader as long as the decoder breaks semantic security of the encryption. And uh, the tracing um, algorithm should never accuse an innocent user whose key was not used in creating this decoder. And moreover, this actually should hold even if arbitrarily many users collude to construct this pirate decoder. Uh, and the goal of um, this work, or in general in trader tracing, is to minimize the communication or storage overhead, uh, meaning that we want to minimize the size of public keys, secret keys, uh, as well as the ciphertext size. So uh, more formally, um, the syntax of trader tracing is as follows. Um, the, key, the generation algorithm will produce the master uh, will produce the public key and n secret keys and as well as a tracing key. So um, here we use a tracing key because it's private tracing. And then the encryption algorithm will take as input the public key and spit out a ciphertext and uh, um, a key that you will use to actually encrypt the payload. Uh, so this syntax is the cap definition. And the decryption algorithm uh, will use the public key and uh, one of the secret keys to decrypt the ciphertext to recover the encapsulated key. And here it's important that we only, uh, we provide the public key for free uh, so that the secret key size only counts the truly secret part in the secret key. Um, because uh, many receiver in, um, uh, in encrypted broadcasts are limited power devices and we want to minimize the requirement of secret storage. And then the tracing algorithm, um, given access to a, a pirate decoder, uh, using the public key and the tracing key will be able to identify a potential trader. And uh, um, the security is, a fo is as follows. The, um, the adversary first gets the public key and then it gets to query um, secret keys of arbitrary users uh, adaptively and uh, then it will provide a pirate decoder. Um, when this pirate decoder is determined, we can um, we, we will run the tracing algorithm uh, on this pirate decoder to obtain this I star, and we'll also define this quantity epsilon star, which is the actual advantage of the decoder. And then uh, we claim that the adversary wins uh, if either I is not in one of the queried keys or the um, bot, or the claimed advantage is uh, at least some threshold and uh, the identify tracer is bot. So the first condition just says an honest user was accused, and the second condition says that the decoder is good, but no trader was found. And we want this, um, uh, the probability that the adversary wins uh, is negligible for all polynomial n and one over epsilon, where epsilon is the threshold of the uh, advantage. And uh, what do we know about trader tracing schemes? Uh, we actually know optimal size, uh, optimal size trader tracing schemes uh, from various uh, constructions, either from IO or from LWE. So you might ask, what are we here for? Um, well, uh, first we want to uh, obtain trader tracing from different assumptions. And uh, this is good for the um, 
intellectual joyness because you can explore different techniques. But more practically, um, uh, you can also obtain deployment-friendlier uh, constructions. In particular, this work will be uh, focused on pairing-based trader tracing schemes, um, for which the library support is better than LWE or IO, for which there is none. OK, so uh, what do we know from pairing? Uh, there are various um, constructions from pairing. Um, and uh, then there's also this recent work by Gendry, which achieved the, the by far best um, total size of parameters. Um, uh, however, all of them have this um, very curious inequality of the product of the three components are at least n. Uh, let me bring you this um, trade-off simplex um, proposed by Gendry. Um, so here, this triangle uh, says the three extremes of um, public key, secret key, ciphertext product being n. And this green part is what was achieved by Gendry and pri uh, pri prior works uh, from pairing. So the first question we ask is whether this, uh, this particular point with question mark is achievable um, from pairing. And more generally, uh, we consider uh, another simplex which we, uh, in which we allow the, um, the product to be smaller than n. And we ask whether any of those points below this um, triangle is um, achievable. And our answer to this question is yes. Uh, we achieve um, this point. So um, in our results, the public key size is cube root of n, and, and the secret key size is uh, constant, and ciphertext size is also cube root of n. Um, so compared to um, the schemes by BSW, um, we achieve, um, we, we, um, we reduce the size of the public key and uh, the ciphertext. Um, and compared to Gendry, we, re we reduce the size of secret key and also remove the use of generic pairing groups, uh, which is a strong assumption. So uh, let me quickly recap how usually trader tracing is constructed from uh, a primitive called private linear broadcast encryption. So in private linear broadcast encryption, um, each uh, secret key is associated with an index and each ciphertext is associated with an index and a message. And upon decryption, uh, you learn the message if the index is greater than, or if the key index is greater than the ciphertext index, and you learn nothing otherwise. Uh, oh, and here I want to mention that uh, both the index and the message in the, uh, in the ciphertext is hidden. So um, to construct trader tracing from PLBE, uh, you make the PLB secret key um, the trader tracing secret key, and then a trader tracing ciphertext is just a PLB ciphertext with index being zero, so that everyone can decrypt. Um, now, to trace, you um, test the decoder with various uh, distributions of the ciphertext. Namely, you change the, um, this is what I call the cutoff index in the ciphertext, and from uh, when, the, when the cutoff index is zero, uh, you get from the premise of this uh, definition that the advant advantage is at least epsilon. And when the, um, when the index is n, uh, you get from the uh, security of PLB that uh, the total gap is uh, at least epsilon because the advantage will be negligible uh, at that point. And then uh, you observe uh, whether there's a big advantage drop between neighboring uh, distributions of the ciphertext. Because if uh, user I is honest, then uh, the decoder will not be able to distinguish between uh, those two distributions of the ciphertext, so the advantage drop will be negligible. So taking the contrapositive, uh, if the drop is um, omega epsilon over n, then the user is a traitor. Uh, okay, now for our work, how do we construct uh, trader tracing? Um, we start with the notion of revocable PLBE, uh, for which there are two revocation mechanisms. Uh, one is the index, the other is the set. So the index revocation is very similar to PLBE. 
uh, and the third revocation is new. So the identity space can be um, written as n1 times n2, and each secret key is associated with two indices, and each ciphertext is associated with uh, um, the first portion of the ind index and also an additional revocation set and a message. So basically, you can decrypt if the um, if this PLB condition is satisfied, and uh, this particular identity is not in the revocation set. Otherwise, you cannot decrypt. And we also want uh, hiding for both the index and the set of revocation. And in particular, the following three properties will be very useful in devising the um, the trader tracing security of our scheme. One is message hiding, which says if you revoke all the keys, uh, maybe just by index, then the, um, the ciphertext will hide the message. And then the index hiding says that uh, if you uh, increase the cutoff index by one, and you actually don't have any key that uh, will distinguish uh, these two kinds of ciphertext by the decryption result, then um, they're indistinguishable. And also set hiding, um, if you have the same index and the same message, but you don't have any key that uh, distinguishes the ciphertext by the decryption result, um, then you also uh, get indistinguishable ciphertext. Okay, and then um, we show that from um, such, a PLB, uh, such a revocable PLB, we have a trader tracing scheme for N1 times N2 users. And the tracing, uh, tracing strategy is very similar to uh, the version in Gendry. Um, basically, to find um, the index, the first portion of index of the trader, you use the index hiding. Uh, and to find the second portion, you use the set hiding property. And in particular, our construction of revocable PLB has uh, this parameter size. The public key is square root of n1 plus n2, and the secret key is constant size. And if we set n1 to be um, n to the two thirds and n2 to, uh, to um, cube root of n, then we get the optimal balancing, achieving the, um, the claimed efficiency. And uh, actually, uh, in order to implement uh, those things from uh, pairing, we relax the notion of PLB security a little bit. Um, the first relaxation is that encryp encryption to any non-empty revocation set requires using the master secret key. Um, therefore, the tracing is only secret uh, key tracing. The second relax relaxation is that uh, encryption to actually non-empty revocation set is adversary dependent. And um, our implementation of the um, revoc uh, revocable PLB is by combining PLB and threshold broadcast in, uh, in Gendry. So uh, the functionality is basically that uh, in each secret key, you also have a random string U. And in each ciphertext, you have uh, a lot of random strings. Uh, you will pick one of them and compute their hemming weight uh, to determine whether you can uh, decrypt or not. And the interesting thing here is that there's no need to hide R's in the, secret, uh, in the ciphertext. And uh, this brings us to the next level of abstraction of attribute-based uh, functional encryption. Um, so in attribute-based functional encryption, we have the secret key um, associated with a function and a predicate. And the ciphertext is associated with an attribute and an input. And you can decrypt to the function evaluation result if and only if the um, predicate evaluates to one. And this can be obtained by combining pairing-based functional encryption and attribute-based encryption techniques. In particular, we combine um, quadratic functional encryption and uh, the so-called dual system ABE um, to obtain the, uh, our, our revocable PLB scheme. Um, now, uh, let me explain uh, why the, like the, the component size coming from the functional encryption is square root. Um, this follows from uh, functional encryption for quadratic uh, functions by Wii, and uh, it has um, basically linear size uh, public key and ciphertext and constant size secret keys. 
And then by using a reduction from um, BCFG17, we can construct a PLBE from QF. Basically, you um, make N1, you identify N1, the set of uh, 1 to N1, uh, as the product of N times N. And then you use one hot encoding to determine who can recover the message or not. And for the other part, uh, ABE part, um, the interesting part is how we achieve constant size secret key. So um, here uh, we construct uh, uh, our scheme for read ones, local read ones, uh, monotone, monotone spam program. So read ones monotone spam program is just linear secret sharing such that each party has, a, has at most one share. And uh, a local ROMSP is uh, such that only a only a few parties have uh, a share at all. And uh, in, in the ABE, the secret key is roughly encryptions of the possible shares, therefore the uh, size of the secret key is proportional to the locality. And it turns out that uh, to implement threshold broadcast, uh, lambda local ROMSP is sufficient. And uh, last, I want to mention that uh, we need adaptive security for uh, X, the attribute part, but we only need selective security for Z part. And uh, this, uh, this actually requires uh, a careful implementation of the hybrids. Uh, the challenge is basically in, in the definition of ABFE, you cannot predict P of X because P of X can be zero or one. And uh, if P of X is one, then the part coming from ABE will be um, difficult to hand. Uh, and then um, the solution is to realize that there's no difficulty. If the, um, basically you, you can, because the Z part is selective, you already know when P of X is zero. Uh, it's when the function disagree. Okay, and let me end my talk with the open questions. Uh, the first question is the product the correct measure of trade-offs for pairing. If so, can we rebalance among the uh, public key, secret key, and ciphertext to achieve n to the, let's say, two over nine size components for all of them? And the second is how far can pairings go? Can we actually achieve uh, size that's uh, subcubic uh, sub root uh, with constant size key? And can we achieve uh, such parameter sizes for broadcast and trace or public tracing? And with that, I'll end my talk. Thank you. Great. We have time for a couple questions. So if you have one, please come up to the podium. So I'll start with one. So I think at the beginning of the talk, you pointed out that in Zandri, they conjectured that the product of the secret key size, ciphertext size, and public key size is one, and you showed that that was not true. Do you have a conjecture for whether there is some bound uh, in the pairing-based world? Like, if you had a conjecture, what would you say the bound would be, if any? Mm, I would say that there's no such bound, unless you can prove it using, like, a black box separation techniques. Okay. So in principle, Because, we can like, get... the, the new developments just challenges our intuition greatly. Great, so in principle, we can get constant for all three. Uh, hopefully in a few years. Okay, great. Other questions? If not, let's thank Chi again. All right, so I think now we have a track switch break, so we'll resume in 10 minutes. So let's thank all of the speakers, both of the speakers in the Trader Tracing session.